from basically day one of diagnosis, I just asked myself, how did I get this disease? For sporadic ALS, they don't know. The doctors don't know. So I took it upon myself to figure it out, find a way to heal myself while medicine, you know, is doing everything it can to find a cure. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Aaron Lazar, thank you for joining us today. It seems like you're always working on something what are you in the middle of now? A Broadway show, a movie, a speaking tour, or maybe a television show? Uh, well, I'm, I'm in the middle of resting, actually, from uh, a very busy uh, a very busy nine months or so. Um, and hi, Tim, and hi, Troy. It's really great to see you guys live. I was, um, I was telling you, Tim, that, that Troy... Uh, through a friend of a friend, I was connected to Troy when I was diagnosed about two and a half years ago. Um, and so uh, it's been two and a half years in the making, I guess. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm finishing a, about a year ago, I put together a, a speaking platform called The Impossible Dream. And uh, we got it off the ground, starting it pretty small in people's homes. And over the last month, it, you know, getting pretty big where I was keynote at a uh, bio, one of the biggest biotech conferences in the world for thousands of people. And, um, and then a pharmaceutical company called Novartis. Um, and at some point, I guess it was, uh, January, a record label reached out and had read about the public announcement of my diagnosis and said you want to make an album and the impossible dream is kind of the anthem for my life right right now and i said sure and they said what do you want to do i said i don't know but let's sing the impossible dream as the title track like we are the world style so we got i think 50 broadway stars showed up in the studio two weeks ago um and we recorded this song with uh, family, my kids, my parents, my high school music teacher, friends that flew out. I mean, we had a hundred people in the biggest recording studio in New York and that album drops August 16th. And it was to share this anthemic song and the message of the song with, with the world, uh, that we all have the power within us to make the impossible possible. We are doing something not just that helps me heal, but as I've as I've started to share my story, uh, we are helping raise awareness to end this this terrible disease um, and help other people live their impossible dreams. And uh, I just am so honored that you guys said yes, and I love you all. And thank you. Um. So after all that, uh, I'm up in Moose Jaw, Canada right now at a re research clinic um, that is it's offering folks with neurodegenerative diseases like ALS, MS, Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, a supplement protocol that's changing people's brains. So you're looking at... Uh, brain scans, functional MRIs before and after this protocol. And the gray matter has filled in where there are spaces or thinning. Uh, the connectivity 
has increased and people's lives are improving. There's um, some some pretty miraculous things happening. And, uh, uh, you know, was invited to come up here with my dad. So uh, here we are. And, and it's been about five days now. I'm just resting. I mean, it's I haven't slowed down. And it's not easy uh, being disabled and doing all this. Um, and I think also to heal, I just needed to stop and I needed to rest. So we're, uh, you guys are the first business call uh, <laughs> since we got here. And I'm proud, proud to say that. So happy to be here. This is our first ever uh, two verse two. Normally we have the man advantage. So <laughs> I know I think yeah. my dad is here. I was like, you know what, dad, I don't think the guys will mind. And, and um, no, definitely not. My dad uh, has had, um, can I speak for you? So he's, I don't know. Can you see him by the way? Cause on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can see him. Um, my dad was diagnosed with multifocal motor neuropathy, which us folks in the ALS world, you know, pray for in the diagnosis phase of things because it's, it's curable with intravenous immunoglobulin IVIG. So my docs put me on that in the hopes that even though my blood work was negative for it, that it would, you know, help. And after about nine months of treatment and not helping, I just stopped. Uh, but my dad, um, was diagnosed with MMN maybe a decade ago. And after, my diagnosis, seeing uh, Dr. Harms at Columbia, he started seeing Dr. Harms. So just for the last couple of years and Harms put him on IVIG for his MMN and it's not getting better. And then he's measuring a couple of his, you know, strength functions and says that they're getting weaker. And he thinks my dad may have ALS, an incredibly slow moving form, which he doesn't think he has. I would find it really hard to believe if he did. We've tested negative for genetics of it all. Full That's what I was about to ask. But they say, you know, there's 30 percent of genes that they haven't discovered yet. I mean, who knows? So that's uh, I figured my dad would be an interesting guy to join join the conversation today. On your on what you're doing in in uh, Moose Jaw, are they seeing that it's slowing progression, or are they seeing return of function? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, both. I'm, I, I came up here, uh, you know, full disclosure, like I, I tried to vet the place and, the and, um, through all my docs, people are really skeptical. Um, and I was basically told that it, it seems non-toxic and safe to do. So you might just have to go up there and see for yourself. Um, and I, uh, can't we, you know, we, we met with Dr. Goodnow, um, a couple times prior to coming up and I really agonized over whether to come because, you know, to be true. To, is it too good to be true? Um, and it, is it, we have these channels that we go through as, as ALS patients and the doctors that we talk to and the people that you, you trust. And you just, there's, there's a lot of people out there that, um, tell you they can do one thing and want to yeah. charge you a lot of money for it. Um, and you hear horror stories about it possibly, you know, increasing the rate of progression and, um, certain doctors, you know, wanting the others to be disbarred and a whole, you know, I mean, you just don't know who to, who to trust. Um, so when you hear yeah. something like people are, are, are slowing and stopping progression, regaining function, uh, you just go, well, how, how does everybody not know about this? Like what, what's going on? So, you know, we're here boots on the ground for, uh, five days now. And from both an experience of talking to other people that are here, uh, people dealing with significant challenge, you know, advanced stage dementia, advanced stage MS, um, pretty, pretty advanced stages of ALS. Um, there are not everyone, but there are people here that are getting better. Um, it's, and, it's, and 
from a scans perspective, from a brain health perspective, I, I, I've only seen a couple functional MRIs of, of, of people, but I think the doctor here would say everyone's brains are getting better. Whether or not that translates to physical improvement, um, I think people here are uh, very hopeful and and they're in it to win it. So. Yeah, it's such a it, it's such a tough thing because with ALS, the, the the patient and the family, everyone's so desperate for everyone's so desperate for any kind of treatment that. Um, and then to your point, right? How do you know that that could be that could be the one that is that really does help? It, anyways, I'm I'm going to follow up with you in a few weeks and see how you're feeling and doing that. I'm, I've actually heard his name before, um, and we ended up deciding not to go. So I'm interested to see what what you think we didn't we didn't uh, do boots on the ground like you said though so you're getting a much better uh, much better read on it yeah my hope is that uh for for folks like like you tim and um you know i got some other friends that you know traveling is pain in the ass um my hope is that i can help dr goodnow here uh you know as somebody who I'm just smart enough, I think, to understand the basics of the science. And it's a lot of science. Um, but to be able to get the supplements to folks at home so that you guys would understand and be able to take this stuff at home. Um, and I think that's their goal here, too. I think they bring people here because it's a whole thing. It's a whole protocol. And... Um, there's a community. Yeah. It's a family, family run center. Um, really good people, wonderful people. And, uh, I mean, I can say, I, I'm hopeful, you know, we'll see. We'll, so we'll definitely stay in touch about it. Troy. I'll be excited to hear how it goes. We looked into it and ended up deciding that it wasn't for us after talking with some doctors, but I want to ask about your life growing up. What was life like in Cherry Hill, New Jersey? Any siblings? What did your parents do? Who got you into singing? It was a uh, small townish, middle class living. It was pretty <clears throat> idyllic as a kid. I've younger brother, younger sister, and same house my whole life. And uh, my parents only moved out of there once all the kids were were well gone. So you guys were in that house for how many years? Thirty years. Thirty years. Um, and, um, yeah, I, uh, I got the best parents in the world, best family in the world, just so supportive, loving. I went to college to be a doctor and then told him I was going to be an actor. And that was, uh, that, that was a fun, <laughs> a fun left turn, but they, uh, they supported me throughout that process. Um, as you know, my dad's here with me now, uh, helping me out, um, and helping other people here. Uh, just a great guy. Construction business. Tell him about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a uh, general contractor. I build specialty medical facilities. I've been doing that my whole life. And uh, Aaron's mom is, was a stay-at-home mom until uh, until uh, 2011, and she decided to come work with me, and she became kind of my office manager, but. As the kids were growing up, it was important to have mom at home. And times were different, you know. I mean, we're talking about 70s and 80s. And, you know, unfortunately, I was able to make a living so that she didn't have to work. And uh, it was a great – I think the kids had a great childhood. And because I had my own business, I was able to take off when I needed to to support the kids in sports and whatever they did. Aaron was a a great athlete growing up and – and like you said, he always wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> and and uh, he got into Duke University and uh, did all the pre-med stuff and took the MCATs. And he was all set to go to med school until he decided to uh, jump ship and move to New York and make it on Broadway. So uh, you know, he's one, he was one of the fortunate few, really, that that had the talent and the skills to be able to make a living. I was worried that he'd be waiting tables like everybody else in New York, but 
Yeah, so, Aaron, when you were young, did you did you like? Uh, I mean, did you get into singing and acting and all that as you were growing up? Yeah, younger than I remember. I I I always used to say I didn't start until high school, but there's pictures of me doing it when I was in elementary school. I just I vaguely remember, you know, and I did it even in high school. It was just a hobby. I mean, it was it was fun. I I, I discovered that I was good at it, and that they wanted me to play lead roles, which you know, it was a lot of fun, Got a lot of attention. And uh, the woman who took over the choir program, Christine Bass, at my high school, Cherry Hill High School West, uh, she revolutionized the program and took it from, you know, 60 kids with like 10 guys in it to over 300 kids with national championship choirs and over 60 guys in the program. And it just became the cool, fun thing to do. So high school teed up college when I got my first voice teacher. And then um, grad school was like Broadway prep training at Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. Got an MFA in musical theater um, and then moved to New York. And, uh, and so it began. You have an incredible voice. When did you first aspire to be a Broadway star? Thanks, Tim. Um, that's very, very, very kind of you. Uh, not, not really until college. Um, a college professor of mine, Jeff Storer, who was an acting teacher at Duke, cast me in uh, the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical Carousel, which was one of my favorites. And I had kind of sworn off acting in college to really focus on getting into medical school. But that was an offer I sort of couldn't refuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, Jeff kind of said, you know, you should consider doing this for a living. And I auditioned for a professional theater company. Again, you were with me. We went up to, I think, New Hampshire or Connecticut or Massachusetts, something we went to the big theater auditions for uh, summer stock. And I saw all these kids who just were well put together and perfect audition books. And I didn't even know what a headshot was. Um, and I asked them where they went to school and they said Cincinnati. So I ended up going back to Duke and I guess Cincinnati conservatory was in the back of my mind as the place to go. If you want to, if you want the training, um, and uh, I started to think in college, well, maybe I can do this. And and that's kind of when that dream really took off. Were you doing acting stuff in at Duke? Uh, that and maybe a play or two here or there took an acting class. It wasn't my focus. I, I got a scholarship from the music department to major in music, so... The music oh, okay. major at the time was very musicology oriented, music history, music theory, not stuff that I was super passionate about. Um, and I didn't really, I didn't really start studying acting uh, until grad school. If my dad and I, or I, either one of us were to sing, you'd rather hear an alarm clock than hear us sing. So it's a low bar to be a good singer compared to us, but you're actually a good singer. <laughs> well, you. you guys have other skills, right? You guys, you guys got other skills. You, your dad is an incredible athlete. Are you? Are you? Were you an athlete, Troy? Are you, are you an athlete? Yeah, I say to people, I'm like the Walmart version. So he played in the NFL. <laughs> I played Division One. He was the Rhodes Scholar. He went to law school, graduated top of his class. I went to law school, not the top of my class. All you know, kind of all the way through. But the knockoff. The the bar was, bar was about as high as it could yeah. get. Somebody just said to me, it's funny. Somebody said to me last night, they, uh, they're they like, hey, was, what was it like growing up with your dad? Like, were you always in his shadow? I'm like, I, I didn't, like, you know, how hard was it to try and get out of his shadow? I said, I'm not getting out of that shadow. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? I'd have to, I'd have to cure, I'd have to cure uh, ALS and cancer or something like that. <laughs> I thought I could do it. <laughs> uh, cool, man. That's cool. Cherry Hill is a suburb of Philadelphia. Please tell me you are not a Philadelphia Eagles fan. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Huge Eagles fan, Tim. Sorry. Huge. <laughs> um, are you still a Falcons guy or how's that work? Oh, yeah. We're Falcons all the way. Falcons all the way. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, look, I've, I've mentioned myself that I get to talk football with you guys, but um, I used to be a full Philadelphia sports fan, a follow you know, all the, all the sports and all the teams. And I guess when I became a dad, you know, not as much time, I focus on one team and it's pretty much the Eagles. Um, so, I mean, I even dreamed two nights ago, 
I was at, I dreamed that I was standing on the sidelines at, at Lehigh Field, if that's where they still practice. I don't even know if their if their summer practices are still there. They used to be, but I had a dream that I was there. I want to take my kids to go see uh, see them train. I'm I'm a bit of an Eagles fanatic. Yeah, we're we're the, a similar way with the the Falcons. My my uh, older brother and younger brother are much more dedicated to it than I am, but. We watch. We pretty much watch all the the Falcons games together. Nice. I read that you were a track athlete in high school, throwing both the javelin and the discus, and you were an actor and a singer in the school's theater productions. How long did it take you to land the lead role? What was it? And were you good at throwing on the track team? Yeah. So my dad was a discus thrower in college, so he started teaching me when I was in junior high. Um, I actually just watched a video of me. When I took my kids to Duke five or six years ago, uh, I got back in the discus circle and, you know, ran a, you know, dry run through the circle. And one of my dreams is to heal and teach my kids because uh, you definitely need your full body to do that. But um, uh, I was really good. I was 12th in the state of New Jersey is about as good as I got. And, and I was... I had just great technique. I wasn't a particularly big guy for discus throwers. And so when I got to college, you know, Duke track was interested in me. I went to throw discus and realized pretty quick that offensive linemen had about, you know, a hundred plus pounds on me. So uh, physics was not going to be on my side. And uh, they converted me to mostly a javelin thrower. I'd, I'd had some success with javelin in high school, but it wasn't my focus. And then I just, um, I think I tore my hip flexor my freshman year um, and I didn't have the time to put in for how, how much time I knew it would take to be really competitive on a collegiate level. Um, but I miss it. I miss the independence of the sport. It was such a great solo sport. Um, the, co- the lead roles, basically by sophomore year of high school, I was playing the leads in the, in the musicals. Um, and that, was the case for the rest of high school, community theater, grad school. So I just kept going. Some somebody must think I'm good at this, and um, and then it took me. Uh, I understudied in in New York on Broadway for a couple of years before a show called The Light in the Piazza at Lincoln Center, and that's when I I kind of broke onto the scene and started playing lead roles professionally. You ended up going to Duke University, so you must have been a whale of a student. When you announced that you were going to go for your MFA in drama, did either of your parents say, excuse me, did you say MBA? Because I thought you said MFA. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the, you know, the MCAT scores at that time, I don't know if it's still the case, but they were good for three years. So I took the MCATs and did well and, and told my parents, you know, I got two years to go to grad school and one year to move to New York or L.A. and give it a shot. And if not, you know, I'll, I have the fallback of, of going to medical school. So I think they I think they bought that. Um, and then uh, six months after moving to New York. So six months and I had six months left before those MCAT scores were going to expire. I booked my first Broadway national tour. So I came back from that tour and uh, <clears throat> I was officially an actor. That was kind of the end of the possibility of medical school for me because I wasn't, I was not taking that MCAT again. I watched some of your clips and you are a fabulous actor. Did you have to choose between Broadway and LA? Um, yes, I, I did at the time. I don't think you do anymore. Uh, the business has changed a lot. Of course, over, you know, it's now 20, 24 years since I was in grad school. Um, you know, at the time, singing was my thing. So even though I was kind of recruited by a manager to go out to L.A., I was like, Broadway is going to be my thing. And then you run into the inevitable realities of, of you know, what you get paid as a theater actor versus what you get paid as a, as a screen actor, stage actor, you know, and the money is just 
excuse me so much. It was anyway, it still is, but that business has changed too. Um, so I always wanted to get out to LA and I would keep trying to get out to LA to expand into television and film. As I was doing that, the New York television and film market itself was expanding. Uh, you know, usually tax credits in a city. I mean, Atlanta is a good example. Um, you guys have become with Pinewood Studios outside of Atlanta. It's like the biggest studios on, I think, west, east of LA. It's the biggest studios maybe in the world, except for London. Um, fact check me on that though. Uh, but <laughs> I would get to LA, do some work, get called back to New York, get to LA, try and move there for five, six months, find out. You know, my wife at the time was pregnant, go back to New York. So we didn't pick up and move there until about eight, nine years ago. And right at that time, the business went from needing to be in L.A. to be in the room and audition to really being virtual for auditioning and stuff. And of course, since the pandemic, it's completely virtual and you can really live almost anywhere unless your show itself shoots in Los Angeles. We're shooting in New York, and it's obviously easier to to set up shop, home base, wherever your show is shooting. But the shows themselves sometimes only last a season. Like, you never know how long the, the gig's going to last. So people seem to be living all over the country, all over the world as actors and just moving temporarily to whatever city they need to move to to do whatever the job is. You mentioned the the pay scale of Broadway versus LA. When you're on, whether it's Broadway or I guess either one, when you start off, I imagine the pay is not great. I mean, not, not as a start off, I'm saying like as a new show. When does the pay scale start to really ramp up? Like if you're on Broadway, if you go on a national tour, does pay jump up? Like is there something in your contract that triggers that? Or do you have to wait till see if you get like a second tour or in TV, a second season? That's a good question. I mean, the, the, the economics of it are, you know, were anyway, you know, television's ad revenue. So those shows are funded by millions and millions of dollars of, of, of advertising. Um, and the budgets on the shows are much, much bigger, et cetera. You know, Broadway is limited to how many how many butts can you get in those seats and how much can you charge them for each of those tickets? And that's only gone up and up and up and up and up as, as, as it becomes more expensive to produce a show in a Broadway theater. You know, those shows are now upwards of $15 million. Um, and you know, you're lucky if you can make somewhere between a half a million and a million a week on, on a successful Broadway show as a, as a gross box office receipts. So, uh, Obviously, that trickles down, and you know, when you start out, you get paid ensemble rate. Which, if you're a single person, you know, living in New York, you can afford to live with some roommates and make a living doing what you love to do. If you want to have a family, you got to get into supporting lead or lead roles. If you land in a hit show, you know, which have I ever been in a hit show? I've been in long running shows, but I don't ever know. I've never been in like a Hamilton, like a big hit. Um, if you land in one of those shows, you get paid more. They have more money. Um, if you are a box office draw, you get paid more. Um, so um, television's just easier because even if you're just starting out, the money is exorbitantly more uh than it is on stage but balance right you know pay the bills and also try and do what you love to do and uh yeah it, it and I, I've, I've enjoyed a, a pretty a pretty interesting ride was that your fiance who you pretended to punch in the TV show The Blacklist? Uh, that is not my fiance. Uh, 
No, just the the lead actress on the show. I actually <laughs> showed that clip. I was like so so was one of the first like stunt fights I ever did, and um, I was all excited about it when it came out. And my kids were really little, and I remember we were sitting around the kitchen table, and I opened up the laptop. I was like, "Guys, look what Dad just did!" And as soon as she bit me in the hand, and my gun goes off or something, my like kids were like three and you know, five years old. And one of them just goes, daddy, why would she do that to you? Why would she bite you? And he just burst into tears. And I was like, shut the laptop. They don't get the mistake. Aaron, I want to ask you about our connection, ALS. I know it stinks to think about, but I'm fascinated by everyone's individual journey with the disease. So about two years ago, you were diagnosed with ALS. Can you tell us about your experience? Um, yeah, that's a huge question. Uh, I, I guess you know to keep it keep it short and sweet. It's it's been uh, transformative. The experience is transformative. Um, from from basically day one of diagnosis, I just asked myself, how did I get this disease? Um, for sporadic ALS, they don't know. The doctors don't know. So. Um, I took it upon myself to fig, you know, figure it out, find a way to heal myself while medicine, you know, is doing everything it can to find a cure. And, um, that has led me on a, a spiritual journey that, uh, has transformed my life. And, um, I see, you know, the, the adversity of it all as a divine opportunity to change. Um, and, and say, if I want to change my destiny with this disease, I have, I have to change. And um, it's been a process of coming into remembering who I really am, having really lost myself um, and not even been conscious of that. And now uh, I, I then started to go, I, I, you know, I reading books, man. I was reading, I think I've read like 70 books now on healing the nervous system by spiritual teachers and you know, renowned scientists and yogis and doctors. And, um, I thought I've learned so much. I want to figure out a way to share it. And that became this speaking platform, which I'd say it's more than a speech because I sing in it. So I don't know what else to call it. It's not really a performance because I tell my story. Um, so I just call it, a, we just call it a speaking platform, but, um, that's where the impossible dream comes into play and and that purpose has become way bigger than me and i think you know you found that tim and troy with what you guys are doing with all the books you've written and the advocacy work that you do and the podcast that you run i mean your life becomes bigger than it even was and and your life was on a huge stage you know with the nfl and everything that you were doing so we can relate to each other there, right? That we live these very public careers. And then what do you do? What do you do with this? How do you make lemonade out of this? Um, so here we are. I read that you are obsessed with why you have ALS and you've come up with some possible answers to your questions. Is that right? Yeah. Um, some people will say, like, why are you looking back? You know, the past is the past. And I sort of I came across Anita Morjani's TED Talk, Dying to Be Me, um, only recently, even though I'd heard about it for a long time. And, you know, she has this near-death experience. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with her, if you've seen her, pot, her TED Talk or read her book. Um, you know, a woman who remissed from cancer that had basically almost killed her. And then, I mean, well, it killed her. She had a near death experience and she came back from that and said, she knew why she got cancer. She knew, she knew why she got it. And she was living her life in so much fear. Um, and I was looking for those kinds of answers and fear is the first thing that, uh, this is before ever, you know, this is two years before, knowing anything about Anita's story. But um, I was like, how did I get this? And I had been living in so much fear in the immediate past of 
leading up to diagnosis from first symptoms to diagnosis was like eight months of hell with muscle twitches and anxiety, insomnia and depression. Um, and then prior to that was chronic fear in my life, which I had not even been aware of from, you know, personal trauma and professional trauma that I really started to look at. And the first decision I made was I got to stop, but fear needs to stop because this disease can be so, uh, you know, inspire so much fear. And it was just like, that's not going to help me heal. So how do I get rid of the fear? Um, and, um, the things I've learned about myself and coming into remembering who I really am, uh, is, is because of the disease. So, you know, I wanted to ask you about that and, you know, what your, what is your experience with it? Um, has it, it, it has it, if at all, you know, do, do you, do you relate to that at all? Or have you had a different experience? If you could go back in time, do you think you could have prevented yourself from getting the disease? Um, you know, that, that question is sort of similar to the, do you, do I regret getting ALS? You know, um, in this world of like, if I could have done things differently, I think we create our lives and I think we do that and are not, we're not taught how we do that. I think we are conscious co-creators of our experience. Um, if I could go back and do things differently, I, yeah, my life would be different because I'd be creating a different life. So if I could go back and, and have eliminated fear and, you know, I'd have a different life, whether I would have ALS or not, I don't know. Um, but that's my opportunity as a parent with my children is to teach them everything I know about how to consciously be, be a conscious co-creator of your experience. So they have hopefully uh, a more conscious awareness of the lives that they are creating and the lives that they're living. I've heard you talk about God as a factor in the universe, but he seems to be kind of an afterthought. I was a church-going Christian before my diagnosis, and I know unequivocally that the source of my disease is the constant pounding and the many concussions I had playing football. But I believe that God allowed this to happen, to draw me closer to him, and I believe that he will ultimately heal me. I know that this is a radical idea, but Jesus was a radical figure. Have you ever considered God as the central figure in your reality? Yeah, man, for sure. I mean, first of all, I don't think it's a radical idea, but I understand that a lot of people do. I think, uh, I think the disease clarifies, um, brings beliefs in, in, into clarity. What do you believe? Um, I, I've had, I had to look at all the beliefs in my life and how those were creating, uh, my life, the, the thoughts that run through the nervous system, the, you know, which are the nerves are the wires that connect the brain to the body. And I got a disease of the nervous system. So I got to run better. I got to run better thoughts through the system and take care of it, you know, and I didn't realize that's what health was. I thought health was eat well and work out like a beast, you know? Um, and health is also mental. Health is also emotional. Health is also spiritual. And I never, I never understood that. So I had only focused on physical health. And this experience has says, Hey, what happens when part of your physical health is taken away from you? How do you become a healthy person? God to me is source energy. So it's infinite source energy. And if from everything I've learned from people that have had near death experiences, uh, some energy healers that I've spoken to people like Anita Morjani, who best selling authors and talk about it. Um, when you cross over, it's pure love and it's pure joy. And that doesn't even do it justice. There's no words to describe 
what it feels like. And so God to me is that it's pure love and pure joy. And the only thing that gets in the way of that is me. I get to choose moment to moment in my life, how I want to perceive that moment. And so this disease has taught me how to connect to God energy. Um, you know, I meditate a lot. Um, and a lot of my meditations are, are intentionally focused on connecting to source energy um, and connecting to uh, that idea that we are creators of our lives, not just managers of our circumstances. I like that line. That's a good line. It's not my line. I think it's Tony Robbins line. <laughs> sounds, it sounds like something out of his book. His yeah. Playbook. I mean, the thing with all that self-help stuff is, uh, you know, you think, what is it? So is this just bullshit? And then you live it. And until you live it, you go, Oh, you know, it's, it's more than philosophy until you, until you practice a belief system and experience it repeatedly, you don't have knowing, you know? Um, anyway. How has the disease affected your work? You know, I used to be in musicals and I can't really do those anymore unless I'm sitting down. So concerts of stuff, I still sing, uh, singing great. Thank God. Uh, making this, making this album transitioned to being a keynote speaker and speaking engagements where I, you know, instead of singing however many songs in a musical or 15 songs in a concert, I sing this one song and I, I do this, you know, keynote speaking. Um, it's affected everything. You know, I, I can't walk, I can walk a few steps unassisted. Um, I can walk slightly more with AFOs unassisted. Otherwise I need a walker. Um, the disease has taken most of my leg muscles from me. It started to take my upper body muscles. Um, it's taken a couple of my fingers and taken the fat out of my hands. Um, so I'm grateful I've got my voice and I can still stand up uh, because I, it, it's a divine, it, it doesn't fail to dawn on me that I'm a performer. And so the way that I've chosen to share my experiences in a way through getting in front of audiences and um, doing what I do. So thank you. Thank God I can still do that. Aaron, I've heard you talk about some people who've raised a tremendous amount of money for ALS. I presume research and providing services and technology for people to cope with the realities of the disease. We have raised a fraction of what I heard you speak of. My question is whether you could put us in touch with them. We really believe in what Mass General Hospital is doing by way of research and compassionate care. We don't keep a dime of what we raise, and we would appreciate any connection you can make. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you guys are probably already connected to some of the individuals that we can talk about offline, but um, I think I think I just know a couple people. You probably know who they are, and uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars have, has been raised. But I don't know, I don't know where where that. Uh, it's it's a specific organization, right? That you guys are probably familiar with. Um, and then I know of an investment fund uh, that's raised tens of millions of dollars. Um, those those two organizations that I'm thinking of, I'm happy to talk to you guys about and see if you're already connected to them. <laughs> asking asking on air is diabolical, Dad. That's that's a low blow. <laughs> no, I just never know, who, you know, who I'm allowed to, yeah, to talk about and what's public and what's not, and I don't ever want to, you know, these are people, some of whom are dealing with the disease, so I don't ever want to be presumptuous. 
Sure. How about your fiance? How did you two meet? And do you two talk about your ALS? Uh, we met online right uh, right at the pandemic, actually. So a little over four years ago. Um, do we talk about it? Yeah. You know, I think I think you have to talk about it. I think our family philosophy has been from the beginning um, very positive. You know, stay very positive, very hopeful, uh, very connected to um, healing rather than uh, struggling. And then when you struggle. It's just part of the ride, but the focus is on is on healing. So she's an incredibly positive person. Um, you know, she's the one who, when I'm having bad days, she's she's able to just help slide it back to, hey, it's just it's just right now, it's just today. You know, the next moments and as a new opportunity or tomorrow's a new day, kind of thing. Um, and my kids are incredible i mean they're they take their lead from me so um as it's gotten harder for me it gets harder for them um but for the most part everybody's doing really well with als i found it even more important than before to look forward to things in the future what are some of your dreams and aspirations um well this album drops august 16th so there are dreams and aspirations for it to, to be something that I can get on stage, you know, healthy and share this music with people. Um, you know, there's aspirations for, for, um, national scale, you know, audiences to experience it on the Grammys. Um, there's aspirations for me as a speaker to really, uh, you know, I don't know how many people have reversed from ALS at this point. I think it's 62, um, that are being studied, you know, by Bedlack. But, um, you know, the aspiration is to be 63 and get out there and share that with people, um, helping empower people to know that we all have that power within us. Um, and we, you know, it's really the spiritual mindset of health, I think. Um, so big aspirations, pretty big travel the world and, and share this message. Aaron, how about, this is a kind of a more, uh, cliche question, but you've worked with some really big name actors. Is there anybody that you worked with that you thought was the most talented? <laughs> I mean, there's so many talented people, right? There's just so so many brilliant, talented people. Everybody in that world is extremely talented, but I didn't know if there was somebody that you're like, you know what? When you, we were on set with X, they just they just had something different about them. Um, it's a great question. Um, I'm on the spot now. I'm thinking of uh, <laughs> so many so many people have blown me away. You know, where you're just like. I can't believe that person can do that. Um, you know, there, there are people on the album like Kelly O'Hara, just, you, you know, whose voice is from the heavens. She's a phenomenal actress. Um, and one of my heroes, Brian Stokes Mitchell, um, you know, same, just the voice from the heavens and great actor, great, great people. Um, so, you know, theatrically speaking, there's, there's so many people that I've been on stage with that I've just been like, you know, we're, this is hallowed ground. We get to make art together on screen. You know, I worked on a couple of the Avengers movies. So I was with many of the movie stars on the planet. We're in, we're in like one room at the same time. And, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is a, it's just a special guy. Um, Tom Holland's, incredibly talented i mean chris pratt these guys are you know were amazing to work with um yeah i could go on and on but yeah that's awesome and then DiCaprio, leo was i got to improv you know just just 
he's like, you want to do some, you want to do one loose? And we were on that movie, Wolf of Wall Street. And just going toe to toe with that guy, just, just kind of ad-libbing, improv I think he's the greatest actor of my generation. So that was an honor. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I was kind of, when I, honestly, when I asked the question, I was kind of thinking you were going to say him, but you have, there, there's so many big names that, I don't know, I figured I'd ask. And then another thing I was thinking about with your more professional career is, did you ever have something that you passed up on that ended up being like a big hit? Like you, you passed, you read a script, you read a part, and you're like, you know what, I really don't want to do that. And that ended up being... No, I, hits are pretty elusive. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> there's some there's some painful stories of actors that have passed up on things that that you go, oh man. Um, but uh, no, it was more jobs that I I probably just didn't get. I, I, they passed mm. on me, and then the job you know became a, a a moderate hit or something. But I can't think of any offhand. So I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask you who are a couple of people that you know that you think we should have on the podcast to tell their story. That's great. I mean, I mean, Dan Dr. Off, you know, know, immediately comes to mind. You've had Merritt on already and that was an amazing conversation. She's an amazing, amazing doctor and seems to be a great person. And, you know, uh, Dr. Harms at Columbia, also, you know, great guy. Um, and amazing doctor. Um, I can connect you with, you know, showbiz folks. So if there's, if there's Broadway and TV and film people that, uh, you guys have an interest in that, you know, I can be of help. I'm happy to connect you. Um, I think, I think you guys are doing a pretty amazing job at lining up great people to, to have these conversations with. So I'm grateful to, be one of them and grateful to you guys for what you're doing. Now on to our final word segment where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? Oh man, the the birth of my kids. What is the biggest adversity you faced? ALS. (laughs) What are you most excited about? Uh, yeah, I'm, I think I'm most excited about the impossible dream and where, you know, reaching as many audiences as we can with, you know, both the speaking platform and the album and the music and seeing where this can go. And also, you know, connected to that is my healing. You know, I'm really excited about life after ALS, life as a healed guy, you know, th- th- that, that, I was just talking with a friend today that Aaron Lazar has never existed. You know, I've been a healthy guy, but I, I wasn't really healthy. I was living in a lot of fear and uh, I was chasing my career hard. You know, Tim talks about all the hits, you know, and how that affects you. I think what I was running through my system uh, also affected me in a way. It was, it was not healthy, um, obviously in a different way, but, but similarly, um, you know, traumatic to the body. So to be healed and be out in the world, having learned everything that this disease has given me an opportunity to learn, I'm excited for that guy. The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? Uh, Love comes to mind, man. Love gets us through. And the amount of love in my life that, like, I have been grateful to be on the receiving end of over the last couple of years when I've needed it. Uh, the friends, the family, and even strangers in the community, uh, new communities, whether it be the community here at this research clinic, the Broadway community, um, the amount of love in my life is just beyond. And uh, I'm grateful to I'm grateful to everyone who's a part of that, and I'm grateful to the to the to all the the doctors and researchers and investors and biotech innovators and teachers uh, and clinical trial folks and everybody who's out there trying to end this thing. Like, let's go, let's end it. Like, it's time. Aaron Lazar, I wish you the blessings of health and happiness. 
all that our Creator can muster, and I wish you well in your quest for answers. Thank you so much for your time today. Anything that we can do for you, we are a phone call away. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tim. That was beautiful. Back to you. Same. Um, we're here for each other. And, uh, you know, so maybe I can only just help you guys with show tickets. So you just, you just let me know. <laughs> Thanks so much, Aaron. It's great to, like you said, we've, we've talked on and off for a couple of years, but this is the closest we've gotten to meeting. We got to change that too. We'll have to meet in person. For sure, dude. We'll, uh, maybe we'll go to that Eagles Falcons game or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't think we'd be caught dead scene with you then on that day. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be an honor for me. I would take a total back seat to my Eagles. I would, I would, I, I wouldn't wear any Falcons gear, but I'd be politely. I wouldn't. I would. I would go so far as to not wear green. I would be politely in 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 homage to Tim Green and the Falcons, baby. I think we'd have to get you in some red and black, but yeah, I don't, yeah. Know, if I, I don't know if I do that. I don't like that. All right, thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Lots of love. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nursecore for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you liked today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.